Moses chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of the man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For, he, for whom has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are not still able. For you are all still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And then I want you to follow me and read there. In, uh, oh, excuse me, I, I was, we've read chapter 3. So I want us to consider the words of Paul, the apostle, as we read these words and know that he's asserting that his proclamation, number one, in, in, is not from God, but is, uh, is not from man, but is from God, divinely delivered by the Holy Spirit. And consequently, the power of the word taught by the apostle is unique in nature because it is divine. And that word is brought to change the human soul, as it was declared in Psalms 19.7 of long ago. It is brought to transform the human spirit, as petitioned in Psalms 51 verse 10. And from the dynamics of God's word, we begin a new spiritual life. The mind is lifted from a natural realm of existence and transformed into a spiritual life in a spiritual realm or dimension of existence, as Colossians 1.13 asserts. And so it results in the change of perception and the unfolding of a unique worldview for the Christian. And it holds all things in a heavenly perspective with godly aspirations. And so this is determined to be true spirituality. And therefore, because of this, we understand then that every Christian and the church in totem is called to spirituality, to live a spiritual life. Spiritual life, then, is the essence of real living. It's interesting that we live in a world that is not spiritual, that has no true spiritual life in it. In fact, it lives, as Paul mentions in Corinthians that we read, in the natural realm. It lives, lives by its nature. So as we understand that, it's, we want to emphasize that when one does not live spiritually, he is not really living at all. And no wonder Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, we were all dead in sin as the rest of the world. It is a sort of conscious death because it is not real living. Think about that. The most important part of our personal existence is intangible. It is non-physical. 
It has nothing to do with the material universe. Think about that. And to try to define humanity by the physical is to completely deprive humanity of real existence and real meaning. Because what we are made of is not physical, it's not tangible, we cannot touch it. For example, morality. Where can you find morality and pick it off a tree? Where can you dig it out in the minerals of the ground? It does not exist there, it is intangible. What about character? Where do you find character? You can't open up a human being and dig it out of his physical organs. It does not exist there. And what about love and joy and kindness and meekness? All of these belong to the eternal nature of spirituality because we are in fact eternal beings. And that very element of our existence shows us that for that reason God provides for us the spiritual life, the spirit. He gives us his Holy Spirit when we are born again in Jesus Christ. And by that we are given the power to become spiritual men, spiritual women, as God expects us to be. So we understand that the greatest contradiction in this life is a person who claims and teaches to be something and then lives completely contrary to what he teaches and affirms and asserts. And of course that old adage is still true. Stigma forfeits dogma. Doesn't matter how much creed you have, how much ideology you carry, what matters is how you live. What does your life show? And so as we see this, we have to understand very clearly that there are those who, though many years in the church, never demonstrate the slightest evidence of being spiritual. There is nothing spiritual about them. They are purely carnal human beings who practice religion. But they have not become what God intended them to be. They do not, as in Romans 8, 28, we're told in 28, they do not conform to the image of Christ. The word conform means to be poured into a mold and become that. And our mold is Jesus Christ. Some of us refuse to even be poured and for that reason never become what Christ wants us to be. And the way we know we become this is by the life that we live. The way that life comes to us and how we meet the challenges of life, how we deal with life, how we react to life, and the decisions that are made in the process affect what we, we become as spiritual beings. So the sim simple display of an air of religious uh, re religiosity does not in any way confirm that we are spiritual. And such people are truly trafficking in false spirituality. In fact, carnality comes in the strongest and most deceptive manner when it traffics as religious uh, living. It, com it thinks and it, it tries to convince itself that it is religious when really it is not. It is religion at a convenience. And there is really no love for God, no love for God's people, no love for things that are spiritual. But they go through the motions day after day, week after week, year after year, and never once even realize that they are purely carnal. So it is carnality with a religious mask. I want you to read then Revelations chapter 3. And I want you to see what the Lord says to the church in Sardis. It's interesting how he writes to the seven churches in Revelation. And these seven churches do not last very long after this letter is written. 
Most of them are gone by the end of the first, mid, second century. They no longer exist. And yet here we have a letter being written to these churches. And so God picks these seven churches, I believe, to uh, illustrate and, and establish the very nature of the several conditions that a church can exist in. In fact, you can have an overlapping of the characteristics of the conditions that are described in this letter of these seven churches. And you find elements of each in many of today's churches. But I want you to see what he says there in chapter 3 of Revelation. He says, to the angel, the word literally said means messenger, the teacher. He says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God. That means complete spiritual insight. And the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. That's a very hard accusation. More than that, it's an indictment when it comes from the Lord. You are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before the Lord, before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard, what you have received and how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And he gives some praises to some of the individuals there, but as a whole, he says, the church is dead. But it's interesting because it has a name that it is alive, that it's, there is, is a, uh, a representation to others that they are alive, that there's things going on. There's a lot of activity, but what the Lord is telling them really is there is a lot of activity, but none of it is spiritual. None of it has to do with spirituality. It is all cardinal. And there could have been many motives, but he makes it clear that it all amounts to inadequacy, insufficiency, and therefore called dead. So the scripture speaks of levels of spirituality. If you go there to 1 John uh, and read there in chapter 2, as John writes his letters, to these Christians throughout the land. And there in chapter 2 and verse 12, he says this, I write to you little children, technoia, the young ones, the newly come, the very small ones spiritually, the children. Because your sins are forgiven you, and for you for his name's sake. And notice how he goes to the other extreme of this. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. The word known is very important. The word is gnosis. The word means intimate, experiential knowledge. You know how God works in your life. You've seen how he does things. You have this intimate relationship with God. He understands you and you understand him. You've been around long enough as his children to learn that. You are old now, but you are beautiful. You are spiritual. You are developed. And so you know him who is from the beginning. And now he says, I write to you, young men, the in-between. Because you have overcome the wicked one. 
I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. See, there's nothing to add to that kind of relationship with God. It's mature. It's where it should be. And he says, and I've written to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. You see, he speaks of the young one because the young one is usually in the care of the oldest one. The oldest Christian always has the responsibility of caring for the youngest, thus the concept of the elders in the church. But it's not by ruling, it's not by control, it's by leadership, by knowing God and knowing how to handle the young ones so that they can go through the process as well. But I want you to know how he emphasizes the young man or literally the strong man, the fighting man. Why? Because it is at this point when you've gone a little past the infancy in Christ and now are in the adulthood which is the transition which is the area and the point which is now going to determine your consistency your loyalty your commitment everything that involves your character that will determine your transformation into the elder type the father type it is at this crucial point that Satan most heatedly attacks God's children because if he can stop you there then you go nowhere if he can catch you there and make you carnal and turn you into a religious carnal human being then he knows that he has stopped the work of the Spirit of God in its tracks and you will have men get old in the body but be dead in the spirit and never be spiritual and never know God as he should know God. So he emphasizes this area of spirituality because it is absolutely vital. And so he speaks of the little children, the new Christians, the inexperienced in spirituality. He speaks of the fathers, the older, matured Christians, those who have this intimate, time-tested relationship with the Father. And he speaks, speaks of the young men who are struggling and maturing and experiencing the battles that challenge spirituality which will determine their growth or their non-growth. So he speaks of these three levels of Christians and may I say to you, every one of us here today is in one of these three levels. And the Lord God knows where each one is. And age does not necessarily determine that factor. So as we struggle in the call to spirituality, we look at spiritual infancy as we read in our introductory text, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through chapter 3, verses 1 and through 3. That has to do with the spiritual infancy. He says, you're carnal as Christians, but that's because you just came over from the natural man, the psychicocentropos. The man that is of the psychological natural mind. He can't see beyond his blind natural sight. He sees things like the world sees it. But he's just come to Christ so he's making that transition. He's born in the spirit. He has that spiritual power in him. But it needs to develop. So it can develop him says you those are your children those are your infants in Christ and so as they go through the process they will either grow into the spiritual fathers or they will grow into what's called spiritual anarchy which means this it is a Christian who has developed in the flesh he is then 
purely carnal. How do you know the difference? Well, the difference is this. A spiritual infant is a man who comes into Christ and begins to grow the early stages of the spiritual life, whether it be one, two, three, four, or five years in Christ. But the carnal man is who, the one who's been there 30 years, 40 years, and has never changed. Never once. He's still the same fella with the same characteristics he had before he came to Christ. He's still as prideful. He's still as foolish. He's still as sarcastic. He's still the same kind of person after all these years. The only difference is now it has a religious mask to it. It has a religious stripe, if we may say, to it. And so the years only cause him to develop in the flesh. And they are years of undisciplined living along with the rejection of spiritual guidance. And so you have that situation. Romans 8 speaks of that. Romans 8 verse 1 he speaks of no condemnation at all in those who are in Christ Jesus. But then in verses 5-8, he says, but they must develop in the spirit. They must heed the call to spirituality, or they will develop in the flesh. He says they will become carnal. He says, and the carnal mind cannot please God. What does that mean? It means it has no disposition to please God. It's not interested in pleasing God. It couldn't care less in pleasing God. If he goes to church, it's just to comply or, or to just say he or she went through the motion. But it's not about loving God. It's not about pleasing God. It's not saying, Lord, I love you and I'm going to go worship you with those who love you like I do. None of that is, oh, I've got to go to church or somebody's going to complain. That sort of mentality. Well, I've got to be there. God probably not let me get that account. You know, that sort of mentality. It's fleshly. It's carnal. I wanted to just read with you very quickly, from, and uh, we'll be done here, what a writer a long time ago wrote. His name is J.C. Ryle. And uh, he was a, a teacher at a seminary and also I did a lot of preaching. This is what he wrote in his journal. It's interesting. He says, there is a generation of Christians in this age who grieve me to the heart. They make my blood run cold. I, I, I cannot understand them for anything that man's eye can see. They make no progress. They never seem to get on. Years roll long and they are just the same. The same besetting sins, the same infirmities of disposition, the same weaknesses in trials, the same chillness of heart, the same apathy, the same faint semblance of Christ, but no knowledge, no increased interest in God's kingdom, no freshness, no strength, no new fruit. Are they not forgetting that growth is a proof of life? Are they not forgetting how awfully far many may go and yet not be true Christians? He may, like, he, he may be like a waxwork figure, the very image of a believer, and yet not have within him the breath of God. He may have a name to live and be dead after all. We ought to have looked on this world as an inn, and we have settled down in it as if it were our home. It ought to have been counted as our school of training for eternity, weaning us away from this world. And we have been at ease in it as if it were our continuing city, or trifled away time in its leisures and pleasures, as if we were meant to play and not learn. We have been careful and troubled about many things. We have allowed the affairs of this life to eat out the heart of our spirituality. We are being consumed by a leprosy of the soul. It's amazing words to hear when someone observes the spirituality of those he teaches. 
So as a spiritual recovery to conclude, we must understand that a Christian can always start again, can always take hold of his Christ and say, Lord, I will be like you. I will be like you no matter what it takes. And recovering spirituality begins with recovering the conscience. Because where the conscience goes, the man goes. It's very simple. So the characteristics of this spirituality then is evident in the life of the Christian. His lifestyle. It's how you live that shows who you are. It's in the speech. It's in the conversations. Are they spiritual? It's in understanding. It's in our attitude, our mentality. It's in our behavior. The fruit of the Spirit, as you find it in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and others, is spirituality. And so as we think of this, we would say that true spirituality involves having a perception and perspective of life with its values completely unique and distinct from those who do not have or know Jesus Christ. That's why we are different. Because we are spiritual. It is to live for God and His glory at all costs. It is to see the moral before the practical. It is to think spiritually instead of selfishly. It is to see the eternal instead of allowing the temporal to distract us and to cause us to lose focus and entice us to compromised, unspiritual living. So Jesus Christ offers us that true spirituality in life. And as we conclude, I'll read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to us. And let this text sink deep into our souls. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Perception. Perception, perspective, vision, all of it is different. It is on a higher plane called spirituality. That is what we are. That is what we are called to be. So this morning I want to say to you very clearly, spirituality is a choice. Have you made that choice? Day. If you have not, I want to encourage you to make the choice to be spiritual starting today.